taking the young man by the hand, said, Come out of it, and he was immediately awakened. This young man was not possessed of an unclean spirit or demon. He was a victim of ordinary epilepsy. But he had been taught that his affliction was due to possession by an evil spirit. He believed this teaching and behaved accordingly in all that he thought or said concerning his ailment. The people all believed that such phenomena were directly caused by the presence of unclean spirits. Accordingly, they believed that Jesus had cast a demon out of this man. But Jesus did not at that time cure his epilepsy, not until later on that day, after sundown, was this man really healed. Long after the day of Pentecost, the Apostle John, who was the last to write of Jesus' doings, avoided all reference to these so-called acts of casting out devils, and this he did in view of the fact that such cases of demon possession never occurred after Pentecost. As a result of this commonplace incident, the report was rapidly spread through Capernaum that Jesus had cast a demon out of a man and miraculously healed him in the synagogue at the conclusion of his afternoon sermon. The Sabbath was just the time for the rapid and effective spreading of such a startling rumor. This report was also carried to all the smaller settlements around Capernaum, and many of the people believed it. The cooking in the housework at the large Zebedee home, where Jesus and the Twelve made their headquarters, was for the most part done by Simon Peter's wife and her mother. Peter's home was near that of Zebedee, and Jesus and his friends stopped there on the way from the synagogue because Peter's wife's mother had for several days been sick with chills and fever. Now it chanced that, at about the time Jesus stood over this sick woman, holding her hand, smoothing her brow, and speaking words of comfort and encouragement, the fever left her. Jesus had not yet had time to explain to his apostles that no miracle had been wrought at the synagogue, and with this incident so fresh and vivid in their minds, and recalling the water and the wine at Cana, they seized upon this coincidence as another miracle, and some of them rushed out to spread the news abroad throughout the city. Amatha, Peter's mother-in-law, was suffering from malarial fever. She was not miraculously healed by Jesus at this time. Not until several hours later, after sundown, was her cure effected in connection with the extraordinary event which occurred in the front yard of the Zebedee home. And these cases are typical of the manner in which a wonder-seeking generation and a miracle-minded people unfailingly seized upon all such coincidences as the pretext for proclaiming that another miracle had been wrought by Jesus. 3. The Healing at Sundown by the time Jesus and his apostles had made ready to partake of their evening meal near the end of this eventful Sabbath day, all Capernaum and its environs were agog over these reputed miracles of healing, and all who were sick or afflicted began preparations to go to Jesus or to have themselves carried there by their friends just as soon as the sun went down. According to Jewish teaching, it was not permissible even to go in quest of health during the sacred hours of the Sabbath. Therefore, as soon as the sun sank beneath the horizon, scores of afflicted men, women, and children began to make their way toward the Zebedee home in Bethsaida. One man started out with his paralyzed daughter just as soon as the sun sank behind his neighbor's house. The whole day's events had set the stage for this extraordinary sundown scene. Even the text Jesus had used for his afternoon sermon had intimated that sickness should be banished, and he had spoken with such unprecedented power and authority. His message was so compelling. While he made no appeal to human authority, he did speak directly to the consciences and souls of men. Though he did not resort to logic, legal quibbles, or clever sayings, he did make a powerful, direct, clear, and personal appeal to the hearts of his hearers. That Sabbath was a great day in the earth life of Jesus yes, in the life of a universe. To all local universe intents and purposes, the little Jewish city of Capernaum was the real capital of Nebadon. The handful of Jews in the Capernaum synagogue were not the only beings to hear that momentous closing statement of Jesus' sermon. Hate is the shadow of fear, revenge the mask of cowardice. Neither could his hearers forget his blessed words declaring, Man is the Son of God, not a child of the devil. Soon after the setting of the sun, as Jesus and the apostles still lingered about the supper table, Peter's wife heard voices in the front yard, and, on going to the door, saw a large company of sick folks assembling, 
and that the road from Capernaum was crowded by those who were on their way to seek healing at Jesus' hands. On seeing this sight, she went at once and informed her husband, who told Jesus. When the master stepped out of the front entrance of the Zebedee's house, his eyes met an array of stricken and afflicted humanity. He gazed upon almost one thousand sick and ailing human beings. At least that was the number of persons gathered together before him. Not all present were afflicted. Some had come assisting their loved ones in this effort to secure healing. The sight of these afflicted mortals, men, women, and children, suffering in large measure as a result of the mistakes and misdeeds of his own trusted sons of universe administration, peculiarly touched the human heart of Jesus and challenged the divine mercy of this benevolent Creator Son. But Jesus well knew he could never build an enduring spiritual movement upon the foundation of purely material wonders. It had been his consistent policy to refrain from exhibiting his Creator prerogatives. Not since Cana had the supernatural or miraculous attended his teaching. Still, this afflicted multitude touched his sympathetic heart and mightily appealed to his understanding affection. A voice from the front yard exclaimed, Master, speak the word, restore our health, heal our diseases, and save our souls. No sooner had these words been uttered than a vast retinue of seraphim, physical controllers, life carriers, and midwayers, such as always attended this incarnated creator of a universe, made themselves ready to act with creative power should their sovereign give the signal. This was one of those moments in the earth career of Jesus in which divine wisdom and human compassion were so interlocked in the judgment of the Son of Man that he sought refuge in appeal to his Father's will. When Peter implored the Master to heed their cry for help, Jesus, looking down upon the afflicted throng, answered, I have come into the world to reveal the Father and establish his kingdom. For this purpose have I lived my life to this hour. If, therefore, it should be the will of him who sent me, and not inconsistent with my dedication to the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, I would desire to see my children made whole, and... But the further words of Jesus were lost in the tumult. Jesus had passed the responsibility of this healing decision to the ruling of his Father. Evidently, the Father's will interposed no objection, for the words of the Master had scarcely been uttered when the assembly of celestial personalities serving under the command of Jesus' personalized thought adjuster was mightily astir. The vast retinue descended into the midst of this motley throng of afflicted mortals, and in a moment of time, 683 men, women, and children were made whole were perfectly healed of all their physical diseases and other material disorders. Such a scene was never witnessed on earth before that day, nor since. And for those of us who were present to behold this creative wave of healing, it was indeed a thrilling spectacle. But of all the beings who were astonished at this sudden and unexpected outbreak of supernatural healing, Jesus was the most surprised. In a moment when his human interests and sympathies were focused upon the scene of suffering and affliction there spread out before him, he neglected to bear in his human mind the admonitory warnings of his personalized adjuster regarding the impossibility of limiting the time element of the creator prerogatives of a creator son under certain conditions and in certain circumstances. Jesus desired to see these suffering mortals made whole if his Father's will would not thereby be violated. The personalized adjuster of Jesus instantly ruled that such an act of creative energy at that time would not transgress the will of the Paradise Father. And by such a decision, in view of Jesus' preceding expression of healing desire, the creative act was. What a Creator Son desires, and His Father wills, is. Not in all of Jesus' subsequent earth life did another such en masse physical healing of mortals take place. As might have been expected, the fame of this sundown healing at Bethsaida in Capernaum spread throughout all Galilee and Judea, and to the regions beyond. Once more were the fears of Herod aroused, and he sent watchers to report on the work and teachings of Jesus, and to ascertain if he was the former carpenter of Nazareth, or John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Chiefly because of this unintended demonstration of physical healing, Henceforth, throughout the remainder of his earth career, Jesus became as much a physician as a preacher. True, he continued his teaching, but his personal work consisted mostly in ministering to the sick and the distressed, 
while his apostles did the work of public preaching and baptizing believers.